much better. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi and today we are continuing our three-part series on Polaroid instant cameras. So in the first episode we had a look at the early days of Polaroid from their founding in 1932 to the launch of their first instant camera in 1948 to the launch of their most successful product ever, the Model 20 Swinger camera in 1965 what we might call the roll film era, even though Polaroid would continue to manufacture original pattern roll film until 1992. In 1963, however, they came out with an even more successful format, which was pack film. So instead of having the negative and receiving layers on different rolls, instead you had these integrated, layered one on top of another, inside a rectangular pack that could be loaded as a unit into the camera and then you could pull out each film element after it was exposed from the side. However, the more important technical development of 1963 was the introduction of Polacolor, the world's first color instant film. And this worked very similarly to the older black and white film, but was considerably more complex. So instead of having just one silver halide emulsion layer, you had three, each sensitized to either red, green, or blue light. And beneath each of these emulsion layers was a layer of dye in the corresponding complementary color, cyan, magenta, and yellow. So when you expose the film, each layer would be differentially exposed depending on the concentration and distribution of each color. So for example, if you're taking a landscape photo with a big blue sky, a large proportion of the blue layer is going to be exposed, whereas a smaller proportion of the green layer is going to be exposed by, say, the trees and other vegetation. Now, after the film is exposed, the ejection process is the same as with black and white film. You pull the film out the side, it gets sandwiched together with the receiving layer and pushed through a set of rollers, which pops the reagent packet and spreads the reagent between the two film layers. However, this time, instead of dissolving and causing the diffusion of the silver halide, the reagents are going to dissolve the dye layers and the exposed portion of each emulsion layer blocks the diffusion of the dye immediately beneath it while allowing the dyes from the other layers to pass through. So for example, the large exposed area of the blue layer from the sky is going to stop the yellow dye beneath it from diffusing through to the receiving layer. However, it is going to let the cyan and magenta dyes through and these will combine on the receiving layer to form blue. Same goes for green. The area exposed by vegetation is going to stop the magenta dye right beneath it from diffusing through, but it is going to let through the yellow and the cyan dyes, which will combine to form green. Now, at the same time, as the dyes are migrating over to the receiving layer, there is an acid component that is diffusing through the receiving layer itself to the front. And when this reaches the front of the receiving layer where the dyes are, this acts as a stop bath. You'll remember that the development chemicals are typically alkaline, and so this reduces the pH and halts the reaction and fixes the image in place. So this is an example of a subtractive color process, which is used for printing images on opaque backgrounds, such as regular photo prints or inkjet and laser printers. When you combine all three primary colors, RGB or CMY, then that will produce black. Transmitted light images, however, like slide transparencies or motion picture film, use the additive color process in which adding all three colors together produces white light. And Polaroid did produce an instant slide and motion picture system, Polychrome and Polavision, respectively, but I'm going to save that for part three because those systems played a key role in the eventual bankruptcy and dissolution of Polaroid. Instead, Let's have a look at two example cameras from the Color Film Pack era. Right, so the first camera we're going to look at today is the Model 180 Manual, which was produced from 1965 to 1969. And this is part of the Series 100 to 400, which started with the Model 100, released in 1963. And these were the first cameras produced by Polaroid specifically designed to use pack film. Now, the Model 180 is a simplified version of the Model 100, whereas the Model 100 had an automatic photoelectric system for setting the shutter speed. The Model 180 has manual shutter speed and aperture controls. Indeed, this is an entirely mechanical camera, the only electric components being the optional flash gun. 
Right, so just like the Model 95 that we looked at last time, this is a folding bellows style camera. So how you open this is you pull up on the cover and hinge it down like that. Now you can either leave the cover dangling below the camera or you can remove it by pulling back on this little tab here and it pops right off. You then flip up the rangefinder unit and it has a little magnetic latch to keep it in place. And to deploy the lens unit and unfold the bellows, you push up on these two buttons on the side and it comes out and locks in place. You'll notice that these buttons are labeled one. In fact, all of the buttons on this are numbered and that indicates the order in which they are meant to be used. So it's very user friendly. Now, in order to load the camera, you flip to the side this latch on the bottom and unfold the rear cover. And you'll see that instead of having two wells for two separate film rolls, you just have a rectangular recess for popping in your pack film. And so you would put that in and make sure that the tabs on the end of the film elements hang out through the slot on the right side of the camera. You'll also see on the inside of the lid, we have our rollers for spreading the reagent between the film layers. And this entire unit is actually removable so the rollers can be cleaned. So if we close that up and close the latch. And then you would pull out the black tab, which would remove the safety cover in front of the film that prevents it from being exposed outside the camera. And now we can have a look at the camera controls. So this uses a coincidence rangefinder for focusing. And so when you look through the viewfinder, you're going to see a little square ghost image that you're supposed to align with the actual image. And the idea here is that when you're looking at an image so small, it's kind of hard to tell whether things are in focus or not much easier to align to images. And you align the images by pushing side to side on the one buttons, which as you'll see through this linkage, moves the lens back and forth. Right, so moving forward, we have two adjustment rings on the lens, one for adjusting shutter speed and one for aperture. And aperture is given not only in traditional f-stops, but also something called EV or exposure values. And this is log two of aperture squared over shutter speed. And the idea is that any combination of shutter speed and aperture that gives the same EV number will transmit the same amount of light onto the film. And so it makes it a lot easier to choose the proper setting. So in this case, our EV values go from 5 to 22, with 14 being the standard setting for color film and 20 being the standard setting for black and white film. This ring also has a B setting. And like the Model 95 camera we looked at last time, this stands for bulb and is a long exposure setting. So when you set this to B and you hold down the shutter release, the shutter will remain open so long as the release is depressed. Now on the left hand side of the lens unit, we have a jack and screw attachment for a flash gun. And on the front, we have a selector switch with three settings, M, X, and V. M is for a regular flash bulb flash gun. X is for synchronization with electronic flashes. And then V is a 10 second self timer. Now on the right hand side of the lens unit, we have our shutter cocking lever, which strangely enough is labeled three instead of two. In the instruction manual, it tells you to reset your shutter immediately after taking a picture, even before you eject the film from the camera so you don't forget it for next time. Then finally, we have our shutter release button number two at the rear here, which as you can see is connected to the lens unit using a little Bowden cable. So once you've taken your picture, what you would do is pull on the white tab that would be sticking out the slot on the side. And as you do this, this door is going to open and release a little yellow tab. And when you pull on that yellow tab, that is going to pull the film out of the camera and through the rollers. And then as with the old black and white film, you would wait about 60 seconds. Again, this varied depending on the type of film and the temperature, and then peel apart the two halves to reveal the final image. And indeed, some models in the 100 to 400 series, such as the Model 190 and 195, had a built-in mechanical or electronic timer in the rear cover to better help you estimate the development time. Now, the last thing to note with the Model 180 is this strange device inside the cover. This is called a cold clip, and this was introduced with the Model 100 in 1963. And as the name implies, this is for taking pictures in cold weather that might otherwise slow down the development process. And this is just two sheets of aluminum held together with a piece of tape as a hinge. And so once you ejected the film from the camera, you would then place it in between these two sheets, fold it up, 
and stick it inside your clothing so your body heat would keep the film warm and help the development process. So the second camera we have here is the Color Pack 80. This was produced from 1971 to 1976 and is the UK version of the Color Pack 2, which was produced from 1969 to 1972. And both are direct descendants of the Model 3000 Big Swinger, which, as I recall from the previous video, was a version of the Model 20 Swinger of 1965 designed to take pack film instead of roll film. So just like those cameras, this is a rigid plastic body camera, and the loading procedure is pretty much identical to the Model 180 that we just looked at. So one thing to note, you'll see at the back of the rear cover here, we have a slot which is for storing a cold clip. And you open this up by swinging back this wire latch, and you can open up the rear. And what you'll notice is that unlike most Polaroid cameras, this doesn't have any rollers, rather it has spring steel spreader bars for spreading the reagent between the film layers. It also has the empty remains of a film pack. If I pull that out of the way and you look down into the camera near the lens, you will see two AA batteries, and that is to power the flash gun and the exposure system. So you would load in your film pack, make sure that the tabs are hanging out the slot in the side, and then close and latch the rear cover. So in terms of controls, this is really very simple. The viewfinder does not have any range finding capability. All it has is a little transparent red square used for composing an image. So for example, if you were taking somebody's portrait, you would align that square with their head. Now at the front, our lens is adjustable in focus from three feet all the way up to infinity. And what's neat is that there's a little mirror here that reflects the numbers on the adjustment ring back into the viewfinder so you can adjust your focus without having to break your sight picture, which is kind of neat. On top of that, we have a slider which adjusts the aperture for when you're using a flash. You can either set it to 3000 ISO for black and white film or 75 ISO for use with color film. So at the front here, we have our exposure control, which uses a photoelectric cell or electric eye, as they would have called it at the time, to adjust the shutter speed depending on the brightness that you set it to. So the idea here is that since you're able to develop your film pretty much instantly, you can burn through a couple of images, getting your exposure exactly right. Now on the left hand side, we have a flash gun, which is built to use flash cubes, which gives you four shots before you have to replace it. If you want to learn more about flash cubes, please check out my video on the history of camera flashes, link in the description. And then finally, we have our shutter release, which can be swung back and forth to lock and unlock it. And just like on the swinger, this is operated simply by pushing it down. Now, just like with the Model 180, once the film was exposed, you would pull out the white tab, the door would open, you would pull out the yellow tab and the film with it and you would wait 60 seconds before peeling apart your film layers to reveal your finished image. So that's it for part two of this series. In the third and final part, we'll be going to the early 1970s when Polaroid released one of its most iconic products, the SX-70 camera, and one of its most revolutionary photo technologies, integral film, which is what most of us think of when we think of Polaroid instant film. So until then, thank you so much for watching. I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.